Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Small businesses, there's a lot to consider nowadays. And today we have on a guest to help us find out what the new normal in the workplace is gonna look like when we come out of this pandemic. Dr. Gia Wiggins, a morale resource. She's gonna help us with different strategies and how we get back to whatever the new normal is and how do we think differently in a different normal. Hope you enjoy the show and we wish you to stay healthy and safe. Hey, I'm Karen. I'm a former CPA, entrepreneur, business consultant with big ideas, and I'm the mom. I'm Katie. I'm a payroll specialist, business owner, and detail-oriented person that makes things happen, and I'm the daughter. Welcome to Cheers to Business. Dr. Gia Wiggins, thank you so much for being on the show today. Your company, Morale Resource, is a national company with that's here locally. Thank goodness for us. And today we're going to be talking about the new normal. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I love um, being on the show and um, yeah, there's so much to talk about, about how we get back to normal, whatever that is. (laughs) Gia, you've been on the show a couple of times, but I tell you what, we've really picked up a lot of new listeners lately. And so tell them a little bit about you, what you do and how they can get. Well, sure. Um, Morale Resource, I started that company about five years ago. We are a human resources consulting company, a boutique one at that. Um, And our focus is small business human resource strategy. So I work with business owners to kind of figure out where they would like to be um, within the next 5, 10, 20 years. And then we build a human resources program for those companies to get them to where they need to go. So we focus on compliance and then do wonderful things such as compensation policies, procedures, uh, performance management, and we just really help them to set themselves up to be successful and then help to connect them with other partners, such as payroll, benefits, um, HRM, and different admin um, resources in order to be able to function within the human resource part of their business. So you'd be perfect helping writing the new playbook in the new normal. Absolutely. And and I think I've had a great opportunity to kind of talk to companies about what they're doing and how to set them up and to also kind of help to guide them through these very odd times with things such as how to lay off their employees, how to set up unemployment, things of that nature, and, you know, policies and procedures to make sure that they're doing them correctly and within the confines of the law. Gee, I bet you've been really busy the last six weeks. I have been extremely busy the last six weeks. Um, I've spent a lot of time just combing through the regulations, the FFCRA, the CARES Act, much like you have, and making sure that I'm speaking with attorneys and figuring out the best way to service my clients during these times. I want to just have a conversation. You and I usually have the best conversations and we were leaning going, getting back to normal as the topic for the show. And you and I talked yesterday evening and tell the turnaround that we came to for the topic today. It's pretty amazing. Well, in one of our many long, long conversations, um, we had a great talk about now that um, the governors are getting together and they're making the decision that they're going to open additional businesses and they are starting the process to recover our economy. There are lots of workers that have one been, you know, laid off or two, a lot of workers that are now working remotely and things look different than they did two, three months ago. And because it looks so different, it could be a real culture shock to all of a sudden one day, you know, your boss tells you, okay, I expect you to be back at your desk on Monday morning at eight o'clock and we're going to do exactly what we did three months ago. And as humans, it just, it doesn't work like that for us. Unfortunately, we're going to have a new normal. And so we were having a conversation about what does that return in the normal look like? And I'm not talking about a quantum leap into what it's going to look like for businesses a year from now. I'm talking about that hard transition period from going from being laid off and wearing gloves and masks to even go to the grocery store to get eggs to going back to work 
and being really productive for the company that you work for and to be as engaged as you were before this whole thing happened. And so that's a process. And I think it's really important that employers and business owners understand that that is a process and there are things that you're going to need to do in order to be able to help your employees go back to, and I'm going to use the biggest air quotes possible, returning back to normal. You know, I had a conversation yesterday morning with someone that had the traditional office, you know, the eight to five. Everybody goes to lunch at the same time. Everybody takes a break at the same time. You know, that soldierish office atmosphere. He was saying, you know, I could get used to this. I said, why not? You know, why build that new building? But he said, yeah, you know, with the one time upfront cost, we can even put cameras in their homes, put a, put a workstation. And I thought, I just, it's like a, a brick hit me. I was going, you can put cameras up in people's houses to watch them work. Right. So not only the invasion that just bothered me up and down, but also the intrusiveness. I hate, oh, hate intrusive. But the mindset of people have been so productive and not been micromanaged with somebody watching over them. And now you're going to watch me. Right. right. We're going to mistrust. Right. Where are the feelings of rebellion and resentment? Mm -hmm. I think all of that's got to be thought out. And and I think people got to talk to their teams. Absolutely. One of the things that I've been concerned about, specifically for my clients that have allowed their people to work from home, and it's the concept of productivity. Mm -hmm. Like, what does productivity mean? Um, So I have a garden and I think I've talked to you about that multiple times. I've planted a garden in my backyard and I am super productive in that garden with a glass of wine out there, you know, pruning my tomato plants and picking aphids off of my okra plants. And I'm really, really productive in that garden. But that doesn't mean that I'm doing all the things that need to be done around my house. Okay, so that doesn't mean that I was washing clothes. That doesn't mean that I'm, you know, painting that door. All the things that were actually on the to-do list in order to make sure that my house is maintained. My garden is pristine, but what about everything else? And so the question that I have for my clients that are allowing their people to work from home is, what are the performance expectations? Did you tell them what you wanted them to do? Do they even know why they're doing what they're doing? So things are different today than they were three months ago. And so, yeah, when you were working, you know, back in January, February, I needed you to do one, two, and three, because this is the client base that we had. We had to make sure that we had all these things done, but business has changed now. So is your team working productively to do the things that the business dictates in order to be profitable at this point? Just because they're busy and they're giving you a timesheet that says that they've worked eight hours a day, but did they spend that eight hours a day doing the things that the business needs in order to be profitable in this new environment? And so by setting those performance expectations and sometimes having to go in and revise those job descriptions and say, this is what I need you to work on. And sometimes what I need you to work on where before you were just working on servicing clients and doing tasks. It may be calling all of your clients and having a conversation with them and saying, hey, how are you doing? Is there anything that I can do for you? It may be, hey, you know, this project that we had put aside because we were just so busy with people coming in and out the door. I need you to focus on those projects. And so you have to still set those expectations and can't allow the team to just work on the things that they think are important. The managers and the employers have to tell them what's important to them at this time. If not, you're possibly paying 40 hours a week for work that's not value added for the company in this new environment. I've never minded if somebody did six, got eight hours worth of work done in six hours. You know, the accounting field for the last few years was going against hourly billing and going to value billing. That means if I performed a service for you, you paid for the value of that service, not how long it took me. All right. So that being said, are workers now going to be paid more like that for the value of the work based on eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, that structure that we've come from? Because I think the accountability is going to be so much more important. Right. Well, and just wondering how that's going to fall into place. You know, somebody wants to put up 
Yes, there needs to be accountability. We actually already put out a post on payroll ball because our girls are loving it at home and Mm -hmm. they're so productive. I've always said that every day you leave, if you're part of my team, I want you to feel productive. And so they get excited and they want to do more. So putting that that prism or chism or whatever the hell it is around somebody, I don't think, I think it's lost its power in some respect. And so how does that come in with not only HR, but with reward and punishment? Punishment's not the one I'm looking for. But, you know, how do you control your business when you can't see them? To go back to your former point, um, you have a lot more flexibility about the value billing if the person is a salaried exempt person. You have way more flexibility in that regard. I do caution employers with their hourly employees to allow them to work six and to pay them eight only because once you start it, it's going to be nearly impossible to end it, (laughs) you know? And so you've got to be very careful about setting precedents because there's a concept called psychological contracts. And with a psychological contract, it is what my expectation is. You are promising me a certain thing. I'm promising you a certain thing. And even if it's not a promise that's been made verbally or on paper, I expect that I come into work and I expect you to pay me. I come into work and I give you work. I expect you to treat me fairly. And so when there's a breach of that psychological contract, engagement goes down. And so in a scenario where you pay someone, I'm going to pay you eight hours for doing six hours worth of work right now. And then when things go back to more of a normal, and then I'm working six hours and I'm like, okay, (laughs) thanks for my pay. Oh no, I actually now, you know, we're going to have to change things up a little bit. So I do caution people um, to make sure that don't start anything that you're not prepared to end. Well, and that builds resentment as well when it's taken away. Oh gosh, You know, I was, I told a 80 year old psychologist who I love, I love that woman. I talked to her last weekend and she's 86 now. But I told her one time, I said, appreciation turns into expectation every single time. We've had that conversation. Yeah. She says, well, you don't do that, Karen. I said, oh, yeah, I do. She said, how do you do it? I said, I'll give you the perfect example. When we moved in our house, whoever got to the mailbox first is the one who got the mail. Well, then my husband, I was late a few days, so my husband was getting it. And I'm like, well, he'll get it. I appreciated it the first time. But then to this day, I expect it. Oh, he'll get it. Right. It's hard to do something nice and be way out there because unfortunately, sometimes too many Atta girls will backfire on you. Yeah. And this is going to sound so pessimistic. I, I've been in HR for over 20 years. I have been to HR person for thousands and thousands of people. I've done thousands of terminations and hires in my career. And I will tell you, there are very few circumstances where a good deed will go unpunished, (laughs) unfortunately. Um, You know, I always have the conversation with people about, you know, things such as bonuses, And making sure that, you know, when you are attempting to engage your team or attempting to reward your team, that it has to be something just not monetary gain. Because the first year that I get a bonus in December, I'm really appreciative of it. The second year I get it, it's confirmation and I'm excited. And I'm like, oh, my God, I didn't know if I was going to get it again. By the third year, even if the business takes a downturn and they don't get the bonus, then it is you've broken that psychological contract. You have taken away money out of my pocket and you're keeping me from feeding my children. Now I was not going to buy Christmas presents until no, I got the bonus. No, it's National Lampoon. It's the National Lampoon. They didn't get right. the, <laughs> the Christmas right. <laughs> and so I always say, it's like, look, you've got to find a way to reward more than just that Christmas bonus. That first year you don't get it, you're going to have a grand mass exodus right out of the building because now you're, you know, ripping comp- compensation from their hands. And so it's always great to have a, a good mix of ways that you in, that you engage your people um, and doing different things. And it, this is the same thing right now with trying to figure out what normal looks like. You know, making sure that when you are attempting to engage your folks, that you are, let's say, for example, everybody's coming back to work. 
let's say May 15th is the day that you're reopening your doors where you're going to end remote work and you're going to bring everybody else back. You're going to bring everybody in. So I've been at home in my group socks. I have the best pair of them. I am group socks ever. I've been at home in my group socks. I'm wearing my comfy pajamas. I'm working. I can stop and make some pancakes if I need to. And I have this flexibility. Okay. I'm working, but I've got this flexibility. And now I've got to be at work at eight o'clock. And now um, you're expecting me to sit at my desk this entire time. So what can employers do to engage their folks to say, hey, you know, I'm glad that you're here and I want you to want to be here. And it's really up to the employer to make sure that the employee wants to be there. So you have to engage them and do stuff that you normally wouldn't do and provide lunch and go around and tell everybody how happy that you are that they're there and, you know, ask them what are their favorite snacks and bring those snacks and give more frequent breaks and have But if you do the snacks two weeks in a row, they expect it. So you built another contract, right? You have, but that may be, that may be something that's a, you know, a, it doesn't cost a whole lot. Maybe it's something that you actually can do, but you've got to do something to make sure that they feel that they want to be there. And so, you know, you can always ask your employees what they want. They'll generally tell you, hey, I know it's a huge transition going from, where you know, working at home for a month and now you're coming back to work. What are some of the things that I can do to make the workplace a little bit more cozy um, to make sure that you feel comfortable and you feel wanted and you're excited about being at work? And you'd be surprised at some of the things that the employees will come up to tell you to say, hey, if you could just do this. That's low hanging yeah. fruit. But mine always, at least the moms, always valued the flexible schedule. I always told them, to, don't, if you miss something in your kids, don't make it my fault. You realign your work schedule so that you can go to your kids, whatever mm-hmm. thing. And so I think that handing over some of that responsibility for, for people to be grown adults. Now, obviously, we don't know how to be grown adults. Otherwise, the government wouldn't be telling us what to do. <laughs> but that's a what if they don't want to come back? They're making more money on unemployment. That's a, what do you do then? So that's a really tough one. The thing that I've had to counsel employers on right now is the fact that you're not going to be able to be your employee's friend. Okay. The fact of the matter is, is that in order for that employee to be able to receive unemployment, they have to be able to work, but there is no work available. That, that's the that's okay. the limit. They have to be able to work, but there is no work available. At the point that the company has work available and they're asking that employee to come back and the employee says no, but they are receiving unemployment, it is up to the company to report that to unemployment. You've got to let them know that we've recalled Um, everybody, uh, there has been a lot of companies that have done the employer's partial claim. And that is when the company was actually filing for the unemployment for the organization, for all of the employees that were eligible. That was amazing because all the company has to do is not file Mm -hmm. because there's work available or to go into the system and just to say that there's work available again. But you can reach out to the department, the out, for example, Alabama, we have the Alabama Department of Labor that actually takes care of unemployment. You can reach out to the unemployment and send them an email to let them know that there is now work available and that will stop the benefit. I encourage every employer to do it. To me, it's fraud. They're taking because it is fraud. Employees never pay unemployment in. Employees never pay unemployment in. Schedule C people do not pay unemployment in. It's the employers pay it based on a three-year look-back period, and it tops out after wages hit, what, $8,000 in Alabama, but every state's different. So you don't pay it all year long, but the first, if you have a lot of turnover, you do, but right. that's the employers. That's the business owners that have people on payroll. That's money they paid into the system. So I personally think they should turn them in. If you don't want to work because you're making, what, 100 more bucks a week at home? 
to do nothing and right. go on Facebook and complain about being locked down. See, I don't get that. I always tell employers, look, you're not, because there are a lot of times employers are afraid that their employees are going to be upset with them. I tell them you're not doing anything, but being honest, you let the employees know business. My job is to be honest. I'm not going to deceive the state. I'm just going to tell the truth. If you're still eligible for the benefit after I've told the truth, that's between you and the state. I'm not going to interfere with that, but it is my responsibility as an employer to make sure that I'm not doing anything to defraud the state. And so if the employees know that from the beginning that you're going to tell the truth, they can make the decision if they don't want to come to work or not. And if they don't feel that they're ready to come back to work, that's fine. But just hire somebody else. You And you can. You know, I've mentioned before that, you know, the temp agencies and the staffing agencies right now, they've got tons of people that are ready to go to work. And so if you've got work to be done, especially if you are, if you have positions that have a lower skill set, you know, if you need people, reach out to the temp agencies or the staffing companies and say, hey, I need five people to show up to work right. on Monday. Here's a skill set that I need. They're more than happy to send people to come to make sure that you can continue to run your business. Absolutely. I hear you. You know, there are people that want to work. I think the the concept of they own a business. So, you know, they have, they, they're they rich or whatever. is so misconstruing anyway. I said it then and I say it now that I think this was a time of opportunity for people to rework their business. Yes. It's always sad when people are sick and they die. But if you can take, you've been given the resources and the tools to rethink your business. And I think new normal is not bad. Correct. Um, right now, uh, and just to talk about pivoting a little bit, um, I teach at the uh, University of South Alabama, University of um, Mobile. And right now I'm teaching an intro to business class. And the focus of that intro to business class is looking at small businesses in our area and looking at the way that they've been able to pivot as a result of COVID-19. And I'm helping these students to think of ways that they could start a business that would be pandemic proof. Yes, yes. What does that business plan look like in a situation where you can't do business as usual? Things as simple, the wonderful things that these places are doing, like the restaurants who are doing curbside and doing family meals. And I mean, there are so many out of the box things, the things that Caligas is doing, all of these out of the box things that these companies are doing that are repurposing and that are reinventing themselves. It's inspirational. And so with my students right now, they're telling me what they want to do. They're telling me the business they want to start. I'm like, that's fantastic. Now let's make a pandemic proof. Let's make it recession proof. What can we do that's different and just pivot just a little bit? What can we do to make sure that if something like this happens again, you may not have to close your doors? So what are the ideas? How do you become essential all the time? And I mean, do you open a, a restaurant here for cats? They put in a drive through They didn't have a drive through before. Right. Uh, what do you do? You go digital all the time, 24-7? Do you work on disaster plans, your processes? I mean, the odds of this happening, we would have said we're not. I think that you always look at your business model from a global standpoint. So there are some types of businesses that you need people that are coming in the door, okay? They, they have to come in the door in order to buy their wares. I think a great example of that is um, I'm a huge Shark Tank fan. There's a company called Daisy Cakes. And I'm not even sure exactly where they are in the country, but it's a lady who bakes cakes and she uses her, her mother's recipe. And instead of just selling the cakes here, she figured out a way to ship them and she sells them all over the world. Able to make them, freeze them, ship them and get them there. And by the time they get to the person, they're fresh cakes. Okay. So some of the things that you can do, I mean, you can, for example, if you have a retail establishment, um, the Fairhope store, fantastic example. Lizette Norman is, I mean, she's a wonderful business person and she's built this huge brand where it says, you know, Fairhope. 
And so people come to Fairhope, they want to go buy the buy these shirts. She's made it available where you can buy a Fairhope shirt anywhere in the country. And she ships all over the place. And you think, oh, well, it's just a store that says Fairhope. You know, why wouldn't you just, you know, make it available here in Fairhope? Because she has a global mindset and said there are people that have been here or want to come here or lived here and they may not live here and they want to come and buy my wares. And so it's about figuring out, yeah, it's a pain in the butt to take a picture of every SKU that you have, but making it available so that people online can come and buy all of your wares. Um, I've got one student who has a a ballet supply company, for example. She wants to do um, supplies for dancers. And so she's been selling them locally. Okay, great. But this is the day of Instagram and the internet and Facebook. Let's make sure that we get your stuff so that a ballerina in France can buy this fantastic, you know, carry-on bag that you have where it has pockets in it and it's different than anything else that ballerinas are able to use. So what can we do to just kind of expand it? And so I believe in repurposing and just thinking a little bit outside of the box and having a lot of fun with it. You know, yeah, one thing I'm, I'm hearing and what you're saying and with the classes and people rethinking and pivoting and that's a real, you know, the word used to be entrepreneur and now nobody's using that. They're saying pivot. But I think it shows more importantly how important your relationships are. It's easier to pivot when you not only have relationships with your vendors, but with your customers. The most successful curbside restaurants right now are people who had relationships with their customers. Absolutely. Leveraging relationships, especially during time of change, is critical. Are you also seeing how much relationships play into this ability to survive and thrive? Absolutely. Leveraging relationships, I mean, locally, nationally, globally, um, having a supply chain around you. And I'm talking about whether it is a physical product or if it's a service is so critical right now. Having those relationships where you can, you know, say, hey, this is something that I'm thinking about. Can you help me with this? Specifically with supply chain, you know, if you have this big global conglomerate that is working with you to provide supplies and products, you know, if you change your mind and you say, hey, I think I want to change and I want to do something a little bit different. That may be a six month process with that larger supplier. But if you have a local supplier or you have someone that's regional that you have a relationship with and they're connected to you missionally, I mean, if you say, hey, I think I want to do something different, they're completely on board. They're like, hey, yeah, let's make this happen for you really quickly. We just and watched so- this play out with the PPP and the banks. We just watched this happen with the SBA. Right. When I called one bank that one, one of our companies is using because we have different banks. And he said, what was your gross revenues? That was the determining factor on who I got put with. Right. So if you were small, you were out and we will be changing banks. Right. Somebody I have a relationship with somewhere else. So everybody takes this lesson as they complain about the big box banks, taking all the big boys first. How are you applying that to people who have relationships with you? Right. You know, it goes both sides. I really think so. Well, even even in this, from the standpoint of businesses that have um, work, your service industry, for example, the majority of my clients that I've picked up specifically around the pandemic have been relationships that I've garnered with other businesses in our area, in our region, where someone says, hey, I have this need. And they're like, hey. I know someone who is spending all of their time focusing on processes regarding these changes. I need you to call, you know, morale resource. And Mm -hmm. it has happened. I mean, you know that to be true, Karen. Those relationships, and I've sent tens and thousands of dollars worth of revenue to my partners at this time because I'm like, you know, hey, I, I know somebody that does this. You should call this person. And so having those relationships and those partners and that networking and having people that you work with and trust is really important when you're trying to pivot, especially. I've always said that. 
always, always be friends with your competitors. Build oh, yeah. a network with your competitors. There's enough to go around. If you get a little greedy, do you know I helped some people in a group that I'm in? And I helped a couple of them with their PPP paperwork. And somebody really had the nerve to call me out on it and say, you're making us look bad because we couldn't get to them. Yeah. Blew my mind. Why would you not want your people helped? Exactly. You've got to, when you're thinking about growing and you're thinking about what you want to do with your business, you have to think globally. But I mean, you can build that process locally. You can work with people that you're standing side by side with. You're having conversations about where your joint struggles are. You know, I think that especially when you're dealing with employees, as we're talking about going back into your new normal, business owners having a place to come together to talk about, hey, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. What are you doing when everything opens back up? Are you bringing everyone back? Um, What did you do regarding unemployment to, you know, notify the state that, you know, you're going to open back up? Having these conversations and employers, you're right, who are competitors or, you know, competitors, um, which a lot of us are where we do a lot of the same things, but, you know, we're still friends and we're working through these industries together. It's really important to just kind of talk about it and say, look, I'm really struggling. You know, we opened our doors and I can't get our people to come back to work. And don't get me wrong. There are some there are some employees who are not ready to come back to work. And I don't think that they should. Those that have compromised immune systems and those that are caring for the elderly or they have, you know, small children at home who may have compromised immune systems or their anxiety level, it's so high about being in front of people again that they are, I mean, having panic attacks about possibly being in front of folks again and in close quarters. Every person is different, you know, so everybody shouldn't have a mass rush back into the front door. I think you have to ease people in. And honestly, there may be a couple people that you allow to work from home a little bit longer because their job isn't critical to necessarily be in the office at that given time. But for the most part, you've got to make sure that we're all having good, honest, transparent communications about what's happening, what our fears are, what our concerns are, and what our plans are. So that if I come up with a great innovative idea and I share that with a competitor mate or with a friend or with a colleague, and they say, you know what, that's a great idea. That's going to help the economy get back to where it was a lot faster because we're working together as a team. I love it. So the new normal, I don't even know if I like saying it like that. What's normal anyway? Every time life gets normal, something mucks up and happens. Right. You know, every time I thought I was at the top of the world, I got cut off at the knees and it's going to continue to happen. So how do you put yourself into a position? And I mean, yourself being a business owner, I mean, uh, yourself being an employee, a team player, a competitor, whatever is, I think that's what this is about today is the expectations, accountability, and forethought to truly service needs, but doing it, it's like you have to think globally, but you build locally and have those relationships. Right. You're right. I think normal is so fluid. Everybody does business a little bit different. The way that you deal with your employees is a little bit different. Some companies take the profits They bring the profits in, they stay there. Other companies take a part of their profits and they give it away. And other employees who go out and work and do volunteer work and it credit. I mean, there are so many different ways that companies um, manage their teams. And so there's not really a normal. I don't think things will ever go back to the way that they were. I think that we know things differently now. We've got to space out differently. We've got to be more considerate about things at this point point. There are certain things that we can do to at least get back to our version, each individual organization's version of normal. You know, things like before I think you have to throw the playbook out. Right. There is no there's no such thing. We write it. Yeah, that's bullshit. Because if you have, if we keep doing things in the accounting world, we call it Sally, same as last year. Why? Because that's how we've always done it. So 
no, no, no. You just got taught that you can't play that way. That game, you can't play this game this way anymore. Right. You got to find a different way to play it. So, you know, I just think the flexible playbook has got to come in play for this to work and people mentally get into a place where they're comfortable again, right. going to a cubicle. If that's your cubicle on the counter or, you know, waiting tables, whatever. But you as the business owner, you got to start playing different. And i tell you something else I've seen through this is that every time somebody didn't either get as much money as they wanted because they weren't taking taxes, they weren't paying taxes out. It's like they wrote these rules for them to give you something, but only if you abided by the way they wanted you to play. And so, you know, another structure as you're dealing with this is how do I save as much as I can, whether it be taxes, payroll taxes or whatever, but also play the game. So it's so much for a business owner. Not only are you playing the the big brother's game, but you're playing the employees games, your customers games, the relationship with your vendors. So it is heavy. So as this new normal comes out, I think people got to really rethink and mind map. You know, that's one of the cores in mastery is that how to mind map your business. Well, I think you need to take that map and start over. Right. Just new crayons. Here's my passion right there in the middle. And then grow out. Now, who's your market base? Now, who's your target? Now, who's your relationships? Who played out for you during this? And being and giving back to those people. I think it's exactly, you know, but. We've got to rethink everything and without, I don't want to be so broad and, you know, to the point that businesses are like, oh, great, you know, now we've got to, you know, start over from scratch. You know, I'm practical. I'm a business owner myself. I mean, I completely understand that. I think that it's a great time, especially as people are going back into their workspaces to think about a a couple of things. Okay. Uh, One is safety, of course. Am I making sure that we're designing the workplace and the workspaces in a way where people can, and I'm not going to say socially distance at work, but they do have space where they feel safe, okay, that we are redesigning things that, I mean, are we really disinfecting? You know, are we are we really cleaning? We've got somebody that comes in and vacuums, but like, are we really providing the chemicals that are available so that people can clean their desk and clean the mouse. I mean, are we cleaning the time clocks? I mean, what are we really doing? You know, let's get rid of the (laughs) air blow dryer in the bathroom and let's get paper towels in the bathroom now because that hot air is just recirculating all of the, you know, biological matter that may be on the floor. I mean, let's rethink those types of things. Let's really clean the work here. There are companies here locally that go in to just sanitize your workspace before anybody else comes in. Phenomenal idea. First time I saw it, I was cheering in my group socks. I'm like, oh my God, what a phenomenal way to repurpose. Hey guys, you're closed right now. We're going to come in and sanitize your workspace. I mean, how amazing is that? Like, can you come to my house? I kind of do it there. I've got a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old. Everything in my house should be sanitized every single day. (laughs) And then the other thing is that, so when you deal with, you know, that need, that physical need, which is the safety, let's talk about some other hard stuff. You know, everybody knows who the ogre is at the workplace, the person that is mistreating your employees and cussing your employees out and being hateful for no reason. So we're going to go through all of this, you know, this entire, you know, stop of the way that we do business. And you're going to come back and you're going to let these ogres treat your folks the same way. No way. I know who you're talking I think it's a great time to kind of level set expectations with your bad performers, which are your, a lot of times they're the managers and the leaders, the ones that every time they say something to the employees, everybody's like, Oh my God, what are they going to say right now in this meeting before you all back in the building, have a meeting with them and say, look, We've let you abuse the employees for way too long. You're not going to be able to do that coming back into the door. So I want, I hope you took this opportunity to really kind of think about things. And I want you to come up with a plan of how you're going to be able to communicate effectively and compassionately and kindly to our employees, because I'm no longer going to allow you to do the things that you were doing before. It's not going to happen anymore. 
You know, another thing that I think that's really important for companies is when there, if people are coming back, you've got to be transparent. I always use the term open the kimono and just let them see, you know, all the jiggly wiggly bits. I think that that's really important right now because the employees, look, I think I called you and had a conversation with you about this, Karen. I have had the (laughs) wonderful luxury of being on Facebook and Twitter and talking to friends and children of friends. And I know that a lot of times the employees, especially when an employer has shared with their employees, yeah, we apply for the PPP loan and we're trying to get everybody to come back to work and we're just waiting on this PPP money to come out. You do realize hopefully, that the news has talked about the maximum of the PPP loan is $10 million. And so your employees think that you just got a $10 million windfall. What? Where is my part of that? Okay, great. You know, I've had unemployment. I'm coming back to work. Okay, but, you know, where's my money? Am I going to get anything in a bonus? Are you going to bump up my pay? Because the government just gave you $10 million for me, right? So I want my part of it. And I'm like, (laughs) no, that's not how it's worked. But that's what they believe. Not all of them. It is. But a good portion of them. And so my suggestion is the day that you open the door, you have a meeting everybody's spaced out, of course, you know, allow them to wear masks inside if they want. And you say, look, this is what we've lost in the last two months. This is where we were last year this time. This is where we are now. We need to work hard because we need to, this is what we need to make this month. This is what we need to make next month. And this is what this looks like to the trickle down goals for you. I need you to be here. I need you to call this many people. I need you to make this many sales. I need you to make this many manufacture this many pieces. I need you to help me find other people in the supply chain. We need to bring this material in at this cost. Everybody has a role in it from the receptionist to the vice president. And you need to let them know this is the position that we're in, not because you're trying to make the company rich or the business owner rich, but because we were this close to not being able to keep the doors open. All right. But, but, but I think you also, you don't tell them the the dollar amount that you got, but you tell them that they gave me enough and I don't have to pay it back. If I use it, I got enough money for two and a half months pay. It was 2.5 times the monthly average of last year. So if I've got two and a half months, that's how long we've got to get ready and bust butt in order to be self-sustaining when this stops. Right. This money's going to run out. So we've got to work use this time. And I don't mind paying you to do it, to be account- accountable, productive, and responsible for your own being of this whole company that we call my business because you know you can't do it without your team so why not have that conversation that this money was only a certain amount for payroll for this period and we're going to run out so we have to come out on the other side of this successful and I want you to be part of it it has to be a team environment they need to know that you need them And you have to communicate, look, I mean, we can't do any of this without you. I care about your family. You know, I know that you care about my family as well. Let's do this together so that we can move forward together and rebuild. But you have to convince the employee that they care about the rebuilding of the company. And guess what? You can't do that if you're treating them bad. (laughs) They have to know, yeah. <laughs> they, they have to be treated well, they have to be respected, they have to feel that they're being paid a decent wage for the work that they're doing. They can't be treated like children. And you have to ask questions and make them a part of the process. I talked about that earlier. If you're telling them to come back to work, asking them what it's going to take. What can I do to make you comfortable and happy to be back at work? And they're not going to all say, well, if you could just give me part of that 10 million, that's not going to be the conversation. There are going to be small things that you can do that are going to make them excited. Can you get us an ice maker in the break room? Ice maker in the break room is a huge deal sometimes. Can I take my kid to school 
and I'm not going to get into 8.30 every day. That's right. nothing. Say okay. Say yes. All right, Gia, you and I, I love you. You, you know that. And we can talk forever, but I know at some point we have to wrap this one up. We'll just have to do another show. So I want to hear your three takeaways from our conversation today and a great bit, something to cheers on. Oh, absolutely. I need a happy cheers. The first thing is that um, as we are coming out of this slowly, um, but we are going to come out of it and we're going to be strong or not stronger than ever. Take a minute to just write the lessons learned from this scenario, what you would do differently if we had to go through this again. Don't let this just be a situation that happened and you learn nothing from it. Really pivot your business and see what you can do to make it pandemic proof and recession proof moving forward. And it may be a different offering. It may be doing something a different way, but just do a lessons learned, a start, stop and continue at the end of this process. My number two takeaway is to really engage with your team and let's leave all of the bad habits behind and come in with a new leaf and a contract between you and your employees, an informal psychological contract that y'all are going to move forward together and you're going to have their back and they're going to have yours too. And the third thing is that as you're being transparent with your folks, Set the expectations, the performance expectations. Tell them what you need from them, but also tell them what you're going to do to make sure that you're upholding your part of the bargain. If you're going to ask them to work hard, then you better bring, give them the resources that they've been asking you for in order to make sure that that job is done. Um, and so I would just say set the expectations on both ends and just walk through it together and come out of it stronger on the other end. We can do it. We're all going to do it together. And let's leverage our relationships with each other. I'm looking forward to making more business colleague friends as we move forward. Gia, you know how much I love you and our conversations. Um, They're just so beneficial all the way around. So if somebody listens to this and they want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Oh, you can reach me on my website, which is www.moraleresource.com. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn, on Facebook. My email address is Gia Wiggins at moraleresource.com and um, M-O-R-A-L-E resource.com. And I'll be more than help, I'm happy to um, speak with any of the listeners um, and give them a free consultation just to kind of see where they are and how I can help them if I can help them. And Gia, we're going to make sure to put in the notes all your contact information. So anywhere somebody listens to their podcast or cheerstobusiness.com, we'll be sure to have you, make sure your information is available. Thank you very much. All right, your cheers for the day. <sighs> this has been um, a very challenging time, um, but my cheers for the day is the fact that I, I think that we're going to come out of this so much stronger on the back end. And I'm excited about where businesses are going to go Um, in the next couple of months. We're going to be doing some fantastic things and we're going to set everything on fire. We're going to blaze some trails and I'm looking forward to it. So that's my cheers. All right. I have a cheers to you and your company for coming and helping the business listeners and everything that's going on today as we get back to the new normal. But also a cheers to Payroll Vault. Payroll Vault sponsored the show today. I was really proud of how corporate and the franchisees came together as this was all fixing to go down with the CARES Act and they were ready and they were able to provide and keep things going for the business owners. So huge cheers to out to them. And I tell you what, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you everybody for listening today. If you like our content and you want us to keep going, please go to iTunes, go to our Facebook, go promote us wherever you listen to a podcast. Thank you. Please be sure to subscribe to Cheers to Business podcast on iTunes or anywhere else that you get your podcast. Visit our Facebook and be sure to give us a like. And if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to discuss, shoot us an email from the website, cheerstobusiness.com. business.com.